The SN2 pathway is a concerted one-stop substitution pathway, and we saw that it was stereospecific. The E2 pathway is a one-stop concerted elimination pathway, and we're going to see here that it's also a stereospecific reaction. Since bonds are simultaneously being made and broken, there's a need for continuous overlap of the orbitals involved. We'll see continuous overlap in the movies that I'll show you in just a minute, but before I do, let's take a look at the chemistry that's happening here. Methoxide is the strong base that promotes the elimination of HBr by the E2 pathway in isopropyl bromide. The curved arrows show the key orbital overlap that must be met in order to bring about the formation of this carbon-carbon pi bond. It's a pi-type overlap between the sigma bond of this carbon-hydrogen and the sigma star that's positioned behind this carbon-bromine bond. That pi-type overlap can only be achieved if there's an alignment of the carbon-bromine bond with the carbon-hydrogen bond. The alignment can be seen in the ball and stick model that's shown here. The carbon-bromine is pointed downward. The carbon-hydrogen is perfectly opposite, pointing upward. It's this hydrogen that's in the right position to have pi overlap with this carbon-bromine sigma star. And so you'll see the base come in, and it will go after this hydrogen. A pi bond will eventually form between these two carbon atoms. Let's see the movie play out. The base is coming in. I'll stop it right here. This is approaching the transition state. You can see the oxygen of the methoxide is attacking this hydrogen. There's a pi bond beginning to form. Notice that the substituents that are out in front, these two hydrogens, will represent these two hydrogens. The substituents that are in the back, the methyl group and this hydrogen, are going to be the substituents that form on this side of the double bond. So as this movie plays, watch for the smooth rehybridization that takes place in these sp3 carbons as they transform into a pi bond. Here it goes again. The base is coming in. We're at the transition state. The leaving group is leaving. And the geometry has changed to the double bond that's flattened out. Now let's watch the evolution of the highest occupied molecular orbital initially located on the methoxide group, bearing the negative charge, and then, finally, at the end of the reaction, located entirely on the bromide, which also has a negative charge and carries that negative charge away. At the midpoint of the reaction, the transition state, there's continuous overlap that allows the charge from methoxide to be transferred to bromide through a developing pi bond. Here's the highest occupied molecular orbital, at the very early stages of the reaction, entirely located on methoxide. As it heads toward the transition state, you can begin to see electron density spill over all the way down to the bromide. A pi-type interaction is developing. And by the end of the reaction, the highest occupied molecular orbital is entirely located on bromide as it carries away that negative charge. These Newman projections show the two conformations that meet the alignment requirements of the E2 elimination. In case number one, the one that we looked at in the previous movie, it's known as the anti-periplanar conformation. Notice that it's a staggered conformation. It's the most favorable. The synperiplanar, in which the CX bond and the CH bond are both heading in the same direction, is an eclipsed conformation. And so although it meets the requirements for continuous orbital overlap, it's much less favorable on the basis of steric reasons. So generally, E2 elimination reactions will go through the conformation number one, the anti-periplanar conformation. Let's look at the consequences of an anti-stereospecific E2 elimination reaction for the example shown here. Remember that stereospecificity means that the stereochemistry of the reactant determines the stereochemistry of the product. What stereochemistry does this product even have? The product's stereochemistry is whether the double bond is cis or trans. If we look at the reactant, it's lined up in the anti-periplanar orientation. The CH bond, and it's the only CH bond on this carbon, is lined up anti-periplanar 
to the carbon-bromine bond. Those two bonds lie in the plane of the screen. The plane of the screen cuts the molecule into two halves. The front half has the methyl group and the hydrogen atom, and those two groups will end up on the same side of the carbon-carbon double bond. Behind the plane of the screen is the phenyl ring and the methyl group, and those two groups will end up on the other side of the double bond. When the elimination takes place, these two carbon atoms will rehybridize from sp3 tetrahedral geometry to sp2 trigonal planar geometry, and it will do that very smoothly, just like you saw in the previous movie, keeping the methyl and hydrogen on one side and the phenyl ring and the methyl on the other side. So the product will end up having the methyl groups in a trans relationship to one another, and that trans relationship was defined by the stereochemistry of this reactant and its requirement to travel through the antiperiplanar conformation. And it was based on an experiment just like this that chemists came to realize that the E2 elimination is a stereospecific reaction.